help on the network issue. Did it get help? So far, it so helped. Good. So far, so good. <laughs> okay. Well, whatever you did. Well, I'll take credit for it. Yeah. Okay, I want to. Good. Gone and I'll, I'll come. If you want to get started That'd here. Good. Good. Uh, good. My great pleasure to introduce Neil Coy, who's uh, going to be speaking today. Um, Neil joined our faculty uh, this summer. Uh, Neil came, a little, a little bio on Neil. Uh, he came to our faculty as chief of CS uh, intensive care. And uh, Neil did his undergraduate uh, work at the University of Iowa, went on to Vanderbilt Medical School, Vanderbilt Pediatric Residency. Then did a uh, critical care fellowship at the University of Alabama, right? Birmingham. Right so far? Birmingham. Correct. Birmingham. Uh, different football team. Or? Don't forget Birmingham. Okay, don't forget Birmingham. But uh, then he's on, on Roll Tide. the faculty at, uh, at Birmingham and at Cincinnati, and most recently, because he's old, most recently Cincinnati. I mean, most recently Minnesota. <laughs> no, he's not. Uh, but he spent the last 10 years in Minnesota as head of their and cardiovascular uh, unit, so uh, he's brought a, a tremendous amount of uh, new insights for us, and I think leadership, and we're, I'm just really delighted that he's here and look forward to your talk. Thanks, Dave. Um, and I may be old, but I know you're older than I am, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can say old. There you go. I'm going to start by apologizing to you sitting on this side of the room because I know during this talk I'm going to completely ignore you all on this side because I'm going to be focused over here, okay? And I apologize because that's the way the room's set up, that's the way the room has to stay set up, but I know I'm going to ignore you, okay? <laughs> but in that, I'm going to also invite you, this is supposed to be grand rounds, right? It's supposed to be a somewhat formal uh, forum. I'm not a particularly formal person, and I think most of you have noticed that so far. Um, so if you have questions, if you have things that you don't understand, if you have a good story that you want to tell, shout it out because I'm probably not going to see you over here, okay? And the same thing goes for you over here on the left. I am going to encourage you over sitting over here, though, that the next time you may want to spend a little bit more and get the expensive seats over here on the left side. Okay. So I'm going to take us all back to, uh, do we have questions? I'm sorry. See, perfect example of why you need to shout out, because I'm not going to see hands, OK? Um, I'm going to take us back to October. And in the same forum, we had a presentation that was done for us by Seth Brown, who introduced us to the topic of children with undiagnosed congenital heart disease that present to emergency departments and or to outpatient uh, clinics. And so I'm going to take that foundation that Seth built very nicely for us, and I'm going to try to build on it a little bit. And I'm going to take you into a topic that is something that I have spent probably the last 20 years looking at, studying, understanding, working with, and being involved with good people who also think about these things. So it's something I obviously have a passion for. And in that passion, I've tried to find a way to say, how can I make this relevant to the primary care provider? Because I think that really is the forum that we want to capture here at Grand Rounds. So hopefully, I've been able to do that for you. So by way of disclosures, I really don't have any financial disclosures other than to tell you these are the two entities that uh, send me a paycheck and are gracious enough to pay me for the work that I do here. Um, I will, throughout the talk, you will notice that there is tribute paid to both of these institutions. Um, and I make no apologies for that. I do want to support them, and I do feel like they deserve the uh, PR work that I can do up here for them. I also want to take the opportunity to publicly thank everybody here who has welcomed me so kindly since July when I started and has been supportive of the things that I've tried to do and have been encouraging. Um, it is really my great honor to be here. I'm humbled, and I am grateful to be a part of both the Children's Hospital and the ETSU teams. So with that, we'll talk a little bit about what the objectives for today are. And in this 
And thank you, by the way, to Melissa Keene for my new uh, lanyard that is a nice Wanger Children's Hospital lanyard. It's coming in very help helpful to uh, hold my microphones in place. Uh, <laughs> So again, in trying to make this talk relevant, I do want to review some of the centricity of primary care physician in some of the thoughts that are going on in healthcare reform. I also then want to move on to define the basic anatomic and physiologic principles of single ventricle physiology and what is termed parallel circulation. I'm going to describe the determinants of both pulmonary and systemic blood flow in single ventricle physiology. We'll try to get you to understand the calculations and the applications of the ratio of pulmonary to systemic blood flow in single ventricle physiology. And lastly, I'll go through just very briefly the principles of some clinical management of patients with uh, single ventricle physiology. Okay. So if you go in and you look under the topic of medical home, you will find very, very many different ideas on what a medical home is. It's a terminology that's been thrown out there as part of healthcare reform. This is the one that I like the best in that I think it really captures what the essence of a medical home is. That is that you have your own personal provider, that there is care coordination so that you, it's kind of one-stop shopping, right? All of your care is taken care of in the same place. There's this treatment of the entire individual. So it's not just based on single organ. I'm hoping you can hear me better now because I can certainly hear myself better. Um, there's uh, continuity of care and uh, there's all of these things that come together. So I was talking to Melissa Keene about this the other day. You know, actually in the world of pediatrics now, those of us who consider ourselves generalists has grown, right? And there really are four groups of us that I think of as generalists. There's those who are out doing the real work in the primary care arena. There are hospitalists. There's us as intensivists. And then there's ED physicians. And so if you think about the whole individual and you think about mind, body, and spirit, I think three of those groups, the hospitalists, ourselves, and the intensive care unit, and the ED physicians tend to focus very much on the whole body but not necessarily pay as much attention to the mind and spirit. And I think that that's where the importance of primary care comes in, is they have that ability to do that in a much more holistic fashion. And so I have actually altered this a little bit to say that I think the primary care provider is actually the foundation for this medical home. And now rather than them being here, I think it's a primary care team that is built upon this solo primary care provider that really is the importance in a medical home. So if we then take that medical home and we put it into the bigger world of accountable care organizations, where do they fit? And so you can see that there's all these other things in the accountable care organization that are focused on and there as resource for the uh, medical home. But I want to draw your attention here to the subspecialists. And that is that these folks are meant to be ancillary, they're meant to be helpful, they're meant to be collaborative. But if you notice, they don't have a room in the home, right? And so they're really not expected to be primary care providers. And so while you have a child with congenital heart disease that's in your home, you do have access to Dr. Anand and Dr. Tashira, but they're not living in the home with you. And so you have to be able to make some decisions on your own without per perhaps their help. So I think that's where the importance comes in understanding and knowing something about single ventricle physiology. So I want to thank Dave Wood for, uh, even though he probably doesn't realize it, he gave me at least the image that's on this slide. And this is 2011 census data from our regional and catchment area of children that are 17 years of age and younger. And if I've done my math right, there's 235,947 children, at least as of 2011, who live in our regional and catchment area. And depending on how you do the math and what numbers you pull out and take into account morbidity, mortality, those things, that means that in our regional area, there's probably about 200 children that are somewhere on the pathway of single ventricle palliation. And if you draw that a little bit closer to home and look in our local region, which is just Washington and Sullivan counties, they account for about 25% of the kids that we have. And that means that in those two counties alone, there's about 50 children that are somewhere on the pathway of single ventricle uh, palliation. So I put this up here not by way of uh, being condescending, but just by way of comparison. So this is the normal human heart. 
And so we all know this, that blood flows from the right atrium to the right ventricle out the pulmonary artery. But that is one single circuit, right? So when blood comes back, it comes back to the left atrium, out to the LV, and out the aorta, which is a separate circuit. And so if we look at that schematically, what we have are two separate circuits with individual pumps, and these are circuits that are connected in series. So you have one pump pumping blood to the next pump that pumps it out, and you have a circular rotation. So they're in series. If we then compare that to a normal, natural, uh, single ventricle heart, that of the frog heart, we see that there are, in this heart, two atria that receive blood back, but they pour into a single ventricle that then has a single outflow tract known as the conus arteriosus. And you can see that there is a membrane in there that tends to separate them out into pulmonary, or in this case, uh, pulmocutaneous, because we remember that amphibians can actually get oxygen through their skin, and systemic blood. Right? So if we look at that schematically, what we have now is we have a single ventricle that is responsible for pumping to both circuits. And this is what's termed parallel circulation. So single pump feeding two separate circuits that come back to that same pump. And so what are the uh, nuances of this uh, single ventricle? And I do believe that, uh, all right. Well, let me, re let, me, let me go back then, because I thought they were in a different order than this. So let's look then at what the human single ventricle is. And I'm going to look specifically at three different types of hearts. The first of those, and the one that people most classically associate with single ventricle physiology, is the hypoplastic left heart. And in this heart, you have left atrium, left ventricle, and aorta that are all diminutive in size. And if you think about development, the way that ventricles and uh, blood vessels grow is by flow. And so somewhere along this pathway, there's been an obstruction to flow that causes the downstream structures to be small. And so in this situation, um, blood that comes back to the LA really has nowhere to go. So it flows into the right atrium, mixes with blood from the vena cava, goes into the right ventricle, out the main pulmonary artery, and out uh, to the, LN, the left and right pulmonary arteries. But notice that here, because there is no, virtually no outflow or very little outflow through the native aorta, you're completely dependent upon uh, your duct of staying open in order to get systemic blood flow. The other thing I'll point out about this aorta is it recognized that the coronary arteries, despite the small size of the aorta, the coronary arteries still come off of that. And so that's where you're getting your coronary blood flow. So in the hypoplastic left heart specifically, there are issues with coronary blood flow as well. So then let's look at the second one, which is tricuspid atresia, where you have a normal right atrium, but you have atresia of the valve between the right atrium and right ventricle so that there's no continuity there. And blood flow really can't go that way. So it goes through an atrial septal defect over onto the left side of the heart where it mixes with blood coming back from the pulmonary artery, or excuse me, the pulmonary veins into the left ventricle. And then depending upon the size of the VSD that you see there, um, you may or may not get flow through that VSD out into the pulmonary artery. And the size of that VSD is going to dictate anatomically how large that pulmonary artery is. So there are some kids that are going to have a very large VSD where the RV is relatively normal in size, the PA is relatively normal in size, but recognize they're still going to have to go down a pathway of single ventricle repair because they have no way to get blood from that right atrium into that right ventricle. So uh, the alternative way to get blood into the PA is obviously through the patent ductus arteriosus. So let's look then at the third one, that's tricuspid atresia. So very similar to uh, um, or excuse me, pulmonary atresia. Uh, that's why I had to hesitate. Very similar to tricuspid atresia, uh, with the exception that many of these may be able to go down a two ventricle pathway. So blood comes back to the right atrium and has the ability to get into the right ventricle. But because there is complete blockage at the uh, pulmonary uh, valve level, uh, blood, again, has to go through this uh, 
atrial septal defect over into the left atrium, into the left ventricle, now out the aorta, and obligatorily blood flow to the pulmonary artery has to come through the PDA, okay? So the reason that this may be able to be a two-ventricle repair is that oftentimes, what's shown here is an intact ventricular septum, but oftentimes there is a ventricular septal defect that now allows you to have a relatively normal-sized right ventricle, and depending upon the degree of atresia that you have here, if it's just a membranous atresia, you can poke a hole through that. If the pulmonary artery is of a normal size, you can then have a two-ventricle repair. So in looking at these three uh, types of single ventricles, I want to go through what the uh, common features of each one of them are. Obviously, each one of them has a single ventricle. For the most part, they have a single great artery. Um, and they need accessory uh, vascular connections in order to make blood flow normally into both circuits. So uh, very important is the interatrial communication and then patent ductus arteriosus. Um, and so as we talk about this, the hallmark of this physiology is this idea of balancing pulmonary and systemic blood flow. So again, let's go back now and let's look at our schematic. This is our uh, series circulation, two pumps, pumping blood out um, to each of their circuits. And so if you think about this, each of those ventricles is responsible for producing one cardiac output, right? So, in fact, if you think about this, and you all haven't had experience with it, but if you put a Swan-Gans catheter and you put it into the right, hand, right side of the heart and you measure flow out the pulmonary artery and you call that a cardiac output, well, what you're really interested in is what the output out of the left ventricle is, but you make the assumption that because these pumps are hooked in series, that whatever's going out the right ventricle has to be matched by what's going out the left ventricle, at least when you're at equilibrium. Obviously, there are change, minute changes in time, but over time and in equilibrium, they have to be equal, right? So each of them puts out a cardiac output. Well, let's look then at the series connection where you, now you have this single pump. Well, that single pump has to provide the same flow to each one of those circuits, so already having a single ventricle puts you at a disadvantage because that ventricle, at best, has to do about twice as much work as an individual separated uh, dual ventricular system. Okay, so that single ventricle then has increased myocardial work just by fact that it has to do twice as much work as a normal ventricle. In addition, because that ventricle is receiving all of the blood flow back from both circuits, it tends to be volume overloaded relative to a uh, ventricle, either left or right ventricle. So in addition to that, because you have this connection now between blood cir circuits, pulmonary circuit tends to be a lower pressure circuit, lower resistance circuit, we should say. And so because of that, when you're in diastole, blood flow tends to flow from the higher resistance circuit into the lower resistance circuit. And so your diastolic pressure on the systemic side tends to fall toward whatever your diastolic pressure is in the pulmonary vasculature, which is typically much lower than what you have in the systemic side. In addition to that, because this ventricle is overloaded at the end of diastole, after it's filled again with blood and ready to eject, it has much more stretch placed on it. And so that pressure is much greater than what it typically would be. And so if we look at the combination of those things, you have a decreased diastolic uh, blood flow or, or blood pressure. You have increased end diastolic pressure within the ventricle. Those are the two determinants of what your coronary perfusion is. And so this ventricle is also disadvantaged because the coronary perfusion to it is somewhat compromised, both by the fact that there's low pressure feeding it and high pressure uh, resisting flow to it. So increased myocardial work is going to result in increased myocardial oxygen consumption. Decreased coronary perfusion is going to mean that you're delivering oxygen less well to that myocardium than it's now in higher demand. And so this is a myocardium that is at high risk for hypoxemia or hy uh, hypoxia of the tissue itself, okay? You could also throw ischemia in there too if you feel like that this coronary perfusion pressure is so low that you're not getting flow. So then uh, 
let's look at this idea of pulmonary versus systemic blood flow. This is a hallmark of this physiology. And so I go back to Ohm's law, and just so you know, I have a pen, I don't have it with me, that was given to me by, by my former fellows. And on it, it has Ohm's law written out, and it says we will never forget. And my response to them was, you better not, okay? So Ohm's law tells us that if, if you have a vessel, the flow through that vessel is determined by the pressure differential upstream versus downstream divided by whatever the resistance in that vessel is, okay? So this is important when you start talking about blood pressure and not all blood pressure is created equal, but that's a discussion for a different day. Um, but it does give us an idea of how we can determine what blood flow is through any given circuit. So if we go back now and we look at pulmonary blood flow and we try to determine what QP should be, we need to know what the upstream pressure is. And if we have a single ventricle that is pumping into both circuits, by definition, that pressure has to be the same on both sides, right? So we know what the pressure is systemically because we can measure it with blood pressure cuff and we can figure out what the mean arterial pressure is. And that then has to be what, it, what the mean arterial pressure on the pulmonary side is. The downstream pressure is going to be the left atrial pressure. If we're talking about the pulmonary circuit. And the resistance is going to be the pulmonary vascular resistance here, noted as RP. So if we want to look at systemic blood flow, we have the same issues. The upstream pressure then is going to be mean, air, uh, mean arterial pressure. Downstream is going to be right atrial pressure. And this is going to all be divided by the systemic vascular resistance. So now if we want to compare them and put them into a ratio, we can calculate QPQS as being equal to this systemic vascular resistance times the difference in uh, mean arterial pressure and LA pressure divided by the resistance in the pulmonary circuit uh, multiplied by the mean arterial pressure minus the right atrial pressure. And so this in some way should make sense to you that if you have a high uh, systemic resistance, you're forcing blood into the pulmonary circuit. If you have a low resistance in the systemic, you're going to tend to uh, draw away from the pulmonary circuit and lower blood flow going through that circuit, right? The other thing to bring up here is that these, typically, we don't think of as being important. Usually, we think of the left atrial pressure and the right atrial pressure as being relatively the same, particularly in a system where we've said we have an intraatrial communication. But depending on that, the size of that intraatrial communication, we can have differentials in pressure if there's res uh, restriction to flow. And so those restrictions to flow can have a bearing on which direction blood flow is going to go, whether it goes to the pulmonary circuit or whether it goes to the systemic circuit. So this is, this is relatively simple for the frog, right? So if you look at it, the frog has two atria that both empty into the same ventricle. So those atria are going to be relatively always under the same pressure. And believe it or not, people have done this study where they've looked at the systemic vascular resistance and the pulmonary vascular resistance in frogs. And as you would suspect, they're the same. And so a frog lives very happily with single ventricle physiology having QPQS that is about the same, one to one. In the human, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, depends on which heart you have, um, that's not true. So we know following birth that the pulmonary vascular resistance begins to drop, right? And so as pulmonary vascular resistance begins to drop, pulmonary blood flow is going to go up. And we have this phenomenon of over-circulation, more blood flow going to the lung than goes to the body. So what's the result of that? Well, if we go back to this pathology slide or pathophysiology slide, what we find is that now the more blood flow that's going to the lungs, if we want to maintain the blood flow to the body at a relatively constant rate, this ventricle is going to be asked to do even more work, right? Because now it's got a circular flow going to the lungs that really is unnecessary. So it's an increased work. Because of that, there's also an increased volume load. That volume load is going to increase both end diastolic pressure and decrease coronary perfusion. 
So all of those things that we talked about previously are now all exaggerated, and we have a myocardium that's at even more risk for hypoxia. And with that is going to be at risk for decreased function. So can we go about and try to quantify what this ratio of QP is to QS? And the answer is yes, we can do that. We can do that using the FIC principle. And the FIC principle basically tells us that oxygen consumption, don't ask me why it's B dot, it is. Oxygen consumption is just equal to cardiac output multiplied by the difference in content of oxygen in the arterial side versus the venous side. So arterial content is measured by this equation. And if you look at this and you do this first part of the equation, hemoglobin multiplied by the saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen multiplied by a conversion factor, and you compare that to this piece of the equation, which is your PaO2 multiplied by 0 0.003, that last factor really is negligible. Okay, it's why God gave us hemoglobin. We don't carry much oxygen without it. And so if we then want to calculate out what oxygen consumption is for the systemic circulation, we want to look at the difference between oxygen in the arterial side versus the superior vena cava side. And I will tell you that I have arbitrarily said, and it's not even all that arbitrary, if you see something on these slides that says SV with a line over it, O2, that's the abbreviation for mixed venous oxygen saturation. The reason that I have tried consistently to use superior vena cava O2 saturations in this talk is that by definition, mixed venous O2 saturation is that that's found in the pulmonary artery. But when you have intracardiac shunting, that no longer holds true. There is literature and data to demonstrate that superior vena cava oxygen saturations track very nicely with mixed venous oxygen saturations. The same is not true for inferior vena cava saturations. And so um, I've tried to stick with this uh, superior vena cava oxygen saturations as much as possible. So then if we run through the equation, we get something that looks like this. So then for the pulmonary circulation, what we're doing is we're going to look at the difference between pulmonary venous oxygen saturation and pulmonary arterial oxygen saturation. And the reason that they're in that direction is just to keep the sign positive, right? And if you think about it, uh, oxygen consumption by the body is the body consuming oxygen uh, from blood. And in the opposite circuit, it's the blood consuming oxygen from atmosphere. So it makes sense that you work it backwards and get a positive sign. Now, if you're willing to accept, and hopefully you are, that these two have to be equal. So in other words, your body can't consume any, or your blood can't consume any more oxygen than what your body is consuming from the blood. And then you run through some uh, algebraic uh, manipulation, you come up with this equation. So if we look at this for you and I, with hopefully two ventricle heart, that with no intracardiac shunting, the arterial saturation and the pulmonary venous saturation ought to be the same, right? So whatever's coming out of the lungs and going into the left ventricle gets pumped out into the artery, those saturations ought to be the same. If we're looking at the other side, the superior vena cava saturation and the pulmonary artery saturation, again, ought to be fairly similar or the same. So for us, two ventricle series heart, QPQS is one, one to one, and that's exactly what you would expect. So in the parallel uh, circulation, what we do know is that all the blood is being pumped out of a single chamber, mixed, and so pulmonary artery saturation and aortic saturation are the same so that we can replace pulmonary artery here just with aortic saturation or arterial saturation. Okay? Questions? I see confusion. All right, I'm going to forge ahead. We'll go through this a few times. So, uh, so let's do some cases. And I specifically picked three, and these are not detailed in any stretch. There are three cases that I've picked to make specific points. So the first one's going to be a three-day-old male with known hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And just to prove to you that I'm not trying to be tricky, he's on PGE. His ductus is open. Um, he's mildly tachypnic and tachycardic. And he has an arterial saturation of 
So for the sake of this argument and to make my point, we're going to presume that his uh, flow to the systemic bed is normal. Okay? So what does that mean? Well, normal, under normal circumstances, your oxygen consumption divided by your oxygen delivery is about 25%. So what that means is that you all sitting here, postprandial, um, are consuming about 25% of the oxygen that is available to your tissues to be taken if needed. Right? If you think about it, that makes some sense because if the fire alarm goes off and something explodes up here, you're going to immediately want to be running out the door. And if you didn't have that reserve, you would instantly pass out because you wouldn't be getting enough oxygen delivery to your brain, right? So this is fairly typical that you consume about 25%. So if we do that and we recognize that, having seen at least this equation, what that boils down to is the arterial saturation minus the venous saturation divided by the arterial saturation. Let's give this baby a mixed venous oxygen saturation or SVC saturation of 65%, okay? You with me? So let's then look at what QPQS is for this baby. So we want to take the arterial saturation, which we said is 90%. We want to subtract out the superior vena cava saturation, which we said is 65%. And we're going to make a, an assumption here. We're going to assume that the pulmonary veins are 100% saturated. So we're going to assume that this baby has normal lung function. And if we run through the calculation, we find out that this baby has 2.5 to 1 QP to QS. And if we look then at the total cardiac output, which we'll define as the blood flow to the lungs versus the blood flow to the systemic circuit, that's three and a half times normal. Okay? So this baby's heart is doing a lot more work than it needs to. So the point that I want to make here, and let me make it even more strongly, so we've assumed that this baby's lungs are functioning perfectly normal, but we're told he's tachypneic, and that may not be true. So what if he's only 95% saturated in the pulmonary vein? Well, now he goes up to a 5 to 1 ratio and has a cardiac output that's six times normal. Okay. So the point is, if you see a baby with single ventricle physiology who's 90% saturated, and I've artificially said we know that his systemic blood flow is normal, and so his oxygen consumption is normal based on delivery, He's overcirculated. So you should never see a baby with single ventricle physiology who you think you need to drive their SATs into the 90% range because that's pathophysiologic for that baby. It's causing their heart to have to do more work. Okay? And if I get nothing else across in this talk, this is a common theme I'm going to come back to. Okay? So let's take another. Uh, oh. Let's not take another case. Let's look at what then is the optimal uh, oxygen saturation for a baby with single ventricle physiology. All right, so if we define optimal as QPQS ratio of 1, then we know that the numerator has to equal the denominator, correct? I'm teaching my daughter Algebra 1 as I go along, so, <laughs> so you're going to see a lot of equations. Um, so let's assume, again, normal lung function, and let's just say that uh, the pulmonary venous oxygen saturation is 1. And if we say that we want the systemic blood flow to be normal, we're going back to the same point that I just made. What I've done is I've substituted in here the saturation data for oxygen consumption divided by oxygen delivery, and we want that to be 25%. Okay, so because I'm studying algebra with my daughter, I know that we have now two equations and two unknowns, so we can solve for them. And it turns out that the ideal saturation for this baby would be 80% on the arterial side and 60% on the venous side. And yes, I did the calculations. Um, so that tells us that a baby with single ventricle physiology who's satting at 80% is right where we want them to be. So let's look at another case then. So this is a five-day-old female. She's got tricuspid atresia, large non-restrictive VSD. Um, she's mildly tachypneic and grunting with tachycardia. Okay. So she has uh, an arterial saturation of 80% and a superior vena cava saturation of 
So if we go through the calculations, we take 80% minus 40% divided by, again, here we're going to assume normal lung function. Uh, so we have a pulmonary vein sat of 100% uh, and we subtract out 80%. This is a baby who has a QPQS of 2 to 1. And again, we're told she's tachypnic, she's grunting, so we're probably not going to be right here. So what if this is 95%? Well, now she's up to 2.7 to 1 and has a total cardiac output of 3.7. So the point to drive home here is that just because you are saturating at 80% on the arterial side doesn't mean you're not over-circulated, right? Now, hopefully, after going through this with you a couple of times, this is all pretty clear. But I will tell you that is this concept on this slide right here that probably led to a lot of early morbidity and mortality in patients who were status post Fontan, or status post Norwood operation, because this was the goal. We managed them to try to drive their arterial saturation as close as we could to 80%, and we completely neglected and did not understand that this was a number we needed to follow as well. Okay, and so we probably over-circulated a lot of those babies initially post-operatively who had low cardiac output um, and treated them inappropriately by trying to drive a saturation to 80%. So then uh, let's look at a third case. So this is a four-day-old male. He's got known pulmonary arterial atresia. He's got an intact ventricular septum. He's tachycardic. He's tachypnic. But he really doesn't have any increased work of breathing. So his oxygen saturation on the arterial side is 60%, and his superior vena cava saturation is 20%. So let's look here at his QPQS, and it turns out his QPQS is 1 to 1. So he's perfectly balanced. He's right where we want him to be. We've minimized as much as we possibly can based on QPQS, what his cardiac output needs to be. But he's 60% saturated. So the point of this is to tell you that just because somebody is desaturated does not mean that they have a lung problem, doesn't have increased work of breathing, we're assuming his lung function is normal, doesn't mean that their QPQS is out of balance. What this is a marker of is this is a baby that has decreased QPQS total. They're balanced fine, but it's just low total cardiac output, okay? So in a baby that has single ventricle physiology, decreased oxygen saturation can be associated with lung disease, but probably more frequently is associated with decreased global cardiac output. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. So let's move on then and let's look at uh, what the palliative procedures are. And I'm going to have to fly through these a little bit. So this is the Norwood procedure. Um, essentially what is done is that the main pulmonary artery is now used to create a neoaorta. Notice that the aorta is involved in that creation, the native aorta. Um, and pulmonary blood flow is then established via a blaylock talzic shunt. I will only point out that this is Vivian Thomas. Uh, some of you may know that there's a 2004 movie that was made about the relationship between he and Alfred Blaylock. Vivian Thomas was a janitor who got involved in Alfred Blaylock's uh, research and became his research tech. Um, and so, in addition to the blaylock talzig nice picture of helicopter. I met her because I couldn't see it. And she said, oh, that's okay. I, I tried to pull pictures relative to the time frame when they were doing the work. And so, uh, um, uh, Obviously, this is an older picture of her. Um, so in addition, very important, atrial septectomy. And this is done, again, to make sure that the mean arterial, or excuse me, the right atrial pressure and the left atrial pressure stay the same. And it's important, in, particularly in the uh, hypoplastic left, to keep that left atrial pressure as low as possible because they're going to be dependent upon um, passive flow and need a downstream pressure that's as low as possible. So that's the classic Norwood uh, that has been uh, subjected to perhaps an improvement by the Sano shunt. Uh, same operation as the Norwood, except for now BT shunt is or, uh, Sano shunt, which is an RV to PA conduit. Uh, 
is substituted for the blalock tausig shunt. And just so you know, there is some preliminary data in 2010 that came out comparing these two. The data is actually reflected what anecdotally we've all seen, and that is that there is an advantage to the Sano modification immediately post-op from stage one, but that advantage doesn't seem to hold true when you look at babies coming into stage two. And so uh, the potential downside of this operation is probably more long-term in that you've now done a ventriculotomy in a single ventricle. So it'll be interesting to see how that data plays out long-term. This is the hybrid procedure um, where it's done less invasively, done via catheter where you place a stent in the PDA to hold it open. They show here a stent in the RA. Most places I think they're doing an atrial septostomy to try to equalize pressures between the two atria. And here, to prevent overcirculation, they put on bilateral pulmonary artery bands. The advantage, the theoretical advantage of this is that it avoids uh, deep hypothermic cardiac arrest and anesthesia during those first uh, few days of life. Um, the place that's doing this the most is Columbus, Ohio. They have some impressive data that nobody else really seems to have been able to replicate. So if we look at all three of those and go back, we basically have taken what we had initially as physiology and we've basically just reinvented it. So it's the same physiology with the advantage now being that we've done an intraatrial communication enlargement that allows these pressures to be equalized and all three of them involve placement of an increased resistor to prevent uh, pulmonary overcirculation. So BT shunt size, Sano shunt size, and pu uh, pulmonary artery banding are all meant to limit pulmonary blood flow. Recognize, though, that despite the fact that you have this resistor in place, the total resistance of the circuit is still this resistor plus the capillary resistor. So if you lower pulmonary uh, vascular resistance, you can still overcirculate, and it's an important point. So um, if we want to optimize tissue oxygen delivery, we have this as our oxygen delivery equation. Um, important to note, it's almost identical to what you saw for consumption with the exception of the fact that you're now just looking at the arterial side. These babies do get lung disease and decreased lung compliance. And so we can get alveolar hypoxia. We can get intrapulmonary shunting. That shunting leads to decrease in pulmonary venous oxygen saturations and by virtue of that, then a decrease in the arterial saturations. Um, both of the alveolar hypoxia as well as the intrapulmonary shunting lead to an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance, which is going to decrease QPQS and further decrease arterial saturation. But if you're holding QP plus QS constant, so the total cardiac output out of that heart is constant, by decreasing QPQS, you actually increase QS. And so the question is, what overall effect does that have on oxygen delivery? So you've increased this, decreased this. Um, perhaps they've balanced each other. So um, in addition to that, if you have decreased lung compliance, you've got increased work of breathing. That increased work of breathing leads to increased oxygen consumption, which may lead to tissue hypoxia, lowers your mixed venous or SVC saturation, which then leads to further lowering of your SAO2. So all pretty straightforward and easy, right? So let's look at some therapies then. So let's look at oxygen therapy for this uh, disease process, and let's take it one limb at a time. So oxygen, by definition, if you're just talking about intrapulmonary shunting, really has no effect, right? Because it doesn't matter whether or not you give oxygen if an alveolus doesn't have any air in it it's not going to further increase oxygenation. So oxygen, for the most part, is going to have very little effect on that pathologic limb. It will, however, decrease PVR, and it does that directly, right? Because oxygen is one of the, in an alveolus is one of the strongest pulmonary artery dilators there are. So that may lead to increase in QPQS and increase SAO2. But remember, we also have this issue of if we're going to increase QPQS, it may come at the expense of flow to the body. And once again, you have this question of, have you done any good? Have you really increased oxygen delivery to the tissue? In addition to that, if we look at the last limb, oxygen therapy really doesn't have any effect on your work of breathing, um, won't really do anything to lower your oxygen consumption. And so if you have a lower QS in the face of a lower arterial saturation, you're going to decrease DO2. And so if you remember nothing else from this talk today, 
remember this, that oxygen therapy in a baby with single ventricle physiology may be helpful, but more often it's going to be harmful. And it's going to be harmful because what you're doing is you may make that arterial saturation look better, but because you've decreased QS by shunting it to the pulmonary circuit and elevating SAO2, you've actually decreased total body oxygen delivery, okay? So again, this is the one big take-home message. And remember, what I just laid out for you is a baby that has lung disease. So if you take that baby that we had earlier with an oxygen saturation of 60%, no lung disease, and you give them oxygen, you're definitely going to decrease their systemic oxygen delivery more. You may make their saturations look better. You may make yourself feel better. But you're actually harming them by going against the primary goal, which is to maintain oxygen delivery to the tissue. <clears throat> so let's look then at uh, the application of positive pressure. So if this is normal FRC, we have decreased lung compliance. By definition, we, for the same given pressure, we have less volume. As you get less volume, you get all of those problems that we talked about uh, in terms of alveolar collapse, alveolar hypoxia, intrapulmonary shunting. But if we apply positive pressure in one of these forms, um, we maybe can't eliminate that pathway, but we can at least diminish the, uh, the effects of that pathway. We can also diminish the effects of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, and so we tend toward normalization of the PVR, normalization of QPQS, and again, if we have constant QP plus QS, you get normalization of QS. In addition, and I think this is probably the more important piece of it, if you apply positive pressure, we're going to decrease the work of breathing, we're going to decrease oxygen consumption, we're going to improve SVO2, and by mixing of that elevated SVO2 with arterial blood, or blood coming back in the lungs, we're going to have an increased uh, oxygen saturation, and overall, we're looking at an increased oxygen delivery. So to summarize, all of these techniques for applying positive pressure with room air, very important, right? Because we just talked about the evils of oxygen if you have single ventricle. Um, all of those things decrease intrapulmonary shunting, decrease pulmonary vasoconstriction. They push PVR and QPQS toward baseline. They decrease your work of breathing, and they increase oxygen saturation. So the overall effect is that you've increased DO2. So if you have a baby, respiratory distress, single ventricle, think positive pressure application sooner rather than later. So I'm going to actually go through this very quickly. So this is if you have decreased uh, systemic blood flow, normal physiologic response, decreased cerebral perfusion, uh, you get vasoconstriction to try to restore normal cerebral perfusion. What that vasoconstriction does if you're a single ventricle is it increases pulmonary blood flow, gets you back to a lower systemic blood flow, and so you have this pathological uh, cycle. If that lasts long enough, you now develop acidosis, which gives you decreased ventricular function. Now QP plus QS is decreased, and so you get into a secondary spiral, okay? Obviously simplistic, and uh, there are cross effects here that we won't get into. Um, and so when you're looking at low QS, I think we've looked now extensively at the balance between QPQS, the issues of global cardiac output are very similar to what they are in a two ventricle heart with the caveat that you have to understand coronary perfusion is compromised, particularly in the patient with uh, hypoplastic left. So as you're giving inotropic agents, you need to recognize that the inotropic agents are going to increase myocardial oxygen consumption. And so you really want to understand that you're going to improve oxygen delivery to that myocardium at the same time. So they're a little bit more at risk from some of the pathological effects of some of the uh, uh, inotropes that we use. Again, very quickly, what's the optimal hemoglobin? So Poisseau uh, tells us that flow is related to the change in pressure multiplied by pi radius to the fourth over eight eta. I had to look up what that Greek letter was, times the length of the circuit. Um, and eta is viscosity. So as the hemoglobin increases, viscosity increases. As viscosity increases, flow decreases. And as flow decreases, oxygen delivery decreases. So if we look at uh, this curve, there is some point at which we're going to optimize oxygen delivery based on what our hemoglobin is. And after that, we're going to decrease it based on viscosity. So the question is, what's optimal? Uh, 
Well, from studies that were done back in the 1960s on animals, that number was determined to be a hematocrit around 45 percent, which corresponds to a hemoglobin of somewhere 13 to 15. And if you had heard this talk maybe 10 years ago, this would have been, and, and maybe in some places still, this would have been the goal for a hemoglobin for any baby with single ventricle physiology. Well, there's been some uh, literature to question that. This was a Canadian study. This is adult critically ill patients. It's not heart patients, not congenital heart patients, where they looked at a liberal versus a conservative transfusion hemoglobin of 9 versus 7. And the results of that were that the patients who were more liberally transfused actually had a worse outcome. Um, and so some suggestion that blood transfusion itself is harmful. Um, same thing was repeated in children. The results were a little bit different in that there was no advantage in either limb, suggesting depending on how you want to look at it, there's no harm in transfusing. Or if you want to look at it on the other side, there's no need to transfuse because the outcome's the same, hemoglobin of 7 versus 9. So what about the patient with uh, single ventricle physiology? This article came out in 2011 where they looked at transfusion and hemoglobins in patients who were status post uh, second stage uh, Fontan palliation and found that there was equivalency between patients who had a hemoglobin of around 10 to 12 versus those who were kept up in that higher 13 to 15 range. So some suggestion that perhaps we don't need to keep the hemoglobins as high. And I think if you look at that physiology that I presented to you, that's macrophysiology. What we don't understand is all the negative microphysiology that's involved with transfusing somebody else's red cells into you that have been stored. And I think both of those are pathologic. The fact that you have some low-level immune response, even if your HLH markers are all matched, and there is some pathological features of just storing the blood itself. So quickly, the stage two, and we won't belabor this, um, is a bidirectional Glenn shunt where essentially the superior vena cava is ligated. The superior end of it is attached to, to the pulmonary artery. Blood, it's called bidirectional because blood flows in each direction. The original Glenn shunts actually were SBC just to RPA, and so the term bidirectional was put on there to identify it over and against the classic Glenn shunt. Okay, in addition to that, obviously, now you have another source of pulmonary blood flow. So if you had a classic Norwood procedure, the BT shunt is taken down. If you had a sono magnification, the sono is taken down. And now pulmonary blood flow comes via uh, your SBC passively to your pulmonary artery. If you had a hybrid procedure initially, the second stage is much more complex in that all of the things that you had to have for that stage one Norwood, you now have to have. And in addition to that, you need takedown of these PA bands. There's usually scarring of the PAs there, so it usually involves some uh, PA plasty to be done. Um, there's difficulty often in getting the stent out of the PDA, and so there can need to be some reconstructive work done on this distal aorta in addition to the creation of this uh, knee aorta. But essentially, at this point now, you're all to this schematic diagram of circulation where you have now put the circuits back more into a series, config series configuration. So you've got blood flow outing, out of the single ventricle, all now going to the body, coming back, and you have an obligate shunt where the IVC still sends blood back to the heart, but now passively blood flows through the SVC to the pulmonary circuit. This blood flow is relatively constant, and if you think about that, it's constant because the brain is very good at maintaining circulation to it in a very standard, steady fashion. And so because the bulk of blood flow coming back from the SVC comes from brain, you actually get a fairly constant uh, blood flow back through the lung. So then Fontaine completion, uh, there's really two types. This is much more of the classic uh, initial where there was a membrane of some variety put into the atrium to baffle blood from the IVC to passively flow up to the pulmonary artery. Um, oftentimes, as depicted here, there was a uh, opening left to allow shunting of blood and pop pressure pop-off from this Fontan circuit into the atrium. 
More commonly now, they're doing what is called a, an extra cardiac fontan, where a conduit is placed from the IVC up to the pulmonary artery, bypassing the heart completely. Um, and there may or may not be a fenestration. Some people leave a little hole between this external conduit and the atrium, others don't. Um, and it all has to do with how high a pressure you think you're going to develop in that fontan and may need some pop off. So the question that I know you've all been waiting for, this is the finality of the palliated heart. You have a single ventricle pumping to both circuits, all connected now in series. And why is it the fish? Well, because this palliated heart is a mirror image of the normal fish heart. The normal fish heart is a two-chambered heart, beats to the gills, pulmonary circuit for them, uh, first, then passively flows through the rest of the body. So quickly, a little over. Um, these are the objectives that hopefully we did. We reviewed the centricity of primary care physician. We defined the basic anatomic and physiologic prim principles of the single ventricle physiology. We described the determinants of pulmonary and systemic blood flow. We uh, hopefully now understand the calculation and application of the ratio of QP to QS. And we reviewed, reviewed just a few of the principles of management. So with that, I didn't leave myself enough time for my favorite part of this, and that is discussion. So uh, thank you all for your attention. I hope I didn't go through that end part too quickly, but uh, as is typical, I ran out of time. I hope you'll be on asking questions. Thank you. I really enjoyed very much. Thank you. The slides absolutely. If you noticed, I was looking over at you for confirmation that what I was saying was correct. And I think, for me, a lot of my questions surround what is the venous saturation, superior vena cava saturation. So I think it's a different way of thinking. And, I th and that's why I tried to present this in a fashion of we, globally, tend to focus on arterial saturation. And our presumption is that if that's not right, there's a lung dysfunction. And in a two-ventricle heart, that is true and the application of oxygen. But it's very important in this to understand that the goal isn't 90%. The goal may not even be 80%, depending on what your venous saturations are. So I think that, to me, revolutionized, in many respects, the management of our post-operative uh, Norwood patients and really led to a leap, uh, move, uh, moving onto a new curve, if you will, of outcomes for those patients. Agreed. I think it's good as far as the single ventricle setting is concerned. In general, talking about the low set versus high set, mm -hmm. as you know, that the support transport stop because we don't still do not know what is the ideal saturation we need to keep and what is the ideal VO2. Mm -hmm. We had the trial going on multicenter trial, and that trial got stopped because that was the what is the ideal set we need to keep for baby? Is it 90, 95, 85, or 80? Nobody has the answer, and that trial got stopped and so many centers. So there's a whole story. So in reality, there's so many things we do not know, and we presume we know. The thing is that as far as the single ventricle to decrease the myocardial work, the QPQS, that's a different story. To have them grow, in general, 
with the things from preterm babies with the lung problem along with the growth issue because this baby typically have some more acidosis so you have to mm -hmm. address that along with the issue with the long term growth so there is always there Right. So I just want to make sure that no, you get the message. And th thank you for that, because uh, I, it is a very different physiology. And I focused very hard because I think that this physiology, single ventricle, is a very misunderstood physiology. And I think that appropriately, and I don't want to discourage anybody from using oxygen in the appropriate setting, because obviously it's very necessary. And we often talk about there's no harm in giving it. Well, in this population there is, and that's the point that I'm trying to drive home. And in your population, obviously, too, there may be a, a harm to it. So, yeah, very different physiologies. Although, interestingly enough, I, I wonder how many of your babies' oxygen saturations may be driven by uh, right to left shunting um, at the atrial level, and so getting actually a higher QPQS than normal ratio. when you have the congenital heart disease and when you have the small gas catheter mm -hmm. and when you can measure the pressure and you have some more venous sac things on, then it makes a completely difference to mm -hmm. how you want to do the thing. That right. same thing with the ECMO. Yeah. You have the venous set and you, you see what you want to try to give and that drives the things on. So. Well, I think that's what makes <coughs> this a difficult general pediatric topic, right? What I tried to bring out here was what are the pitfalls of management not, obviously I use the examples of those babies who had not yet been palliated, but the baby that's gonna be seen in the clinic at their two month, four month, six month checkup where they're getting shots is a kid that's got that initial stage one Norwood palliation. And so their physiology is the same, not as likely to overcirculate, at least at a baseline, but can be brought to overcirculate if you give them oxygen. And so, I live in a world where I have all the techno toys, right? I can measure venous oxygen saturations. When we used to get them back in Cincinnati, they used to have a pulmonary vein catheter in as well, so we knew exactly how well the lung function was and how much of SAO2 was dependent upon their lung function. So we had all of those things. So it is a difficult thing in the, in the clinician's office if you've got a baby with single ventricle coming in for well child check at four months and their oxygenation is 60% on the arterial side, the impetus is going to be, let's put that baby on oxygen, and that may be, as I tried to point out in that third case scenario, exactly the wrong thing to do. So, so that, that, was my, that was my goal, was to try to bring it to a level that uh, didn't involve all the technology that we have, but use the aspects of of that physiology to try to understand if you don't have those numbers, an appropriate response to it. The oxygen is not that good, and oxygen is the and toxicity, and that's why now we used to start with 100%, now we start with 21% at two right. minutes. So right. oxygen is like a drug, there is a toxicity, so yeah. it does not come. There is always a whole next topic, pre oxygen radical and toxicity. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> but some of the children went with old peers, they tell their parents what their saturation is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So when they go to the ER, they can tell them this is what it's supposed to be. So we try to keep them right. uh, yeah. there. And the movie that you mentioned, I do have a copy of it. I make all the residents and students watch oh, it. Good. So residents, question for you. Babies discharged from the nursery, oxygen saturations of 85%, let's say. And they come back to you at four months. What would you expect their saturations to be? Higher, lower, or the same? One in three chance. I see some consulting going on. Any, anybody brave? So think about it. So depending, independent of what repair they've had, right, all three of them give you a fixed shunt to the lung, right? Fixed size, fixed resistance. 
So as you grow, what would you anticipate your flow needs to be? 